think it's going to be essentially complete. Uh, there may be a few sectors or industries that don't feel like they got back to the uh, to the finish line on that. But for the most part, I think it's going to be uh, uh, equal and not better. And I think certainly our livestock uh, group will feel good and uh, wheat and others. But uh, we uh, we think it'll be a well received agreement. Any timeline on I think again. Uh, these are the, the, the type of announcements on the details, USTR. Um, when you have an agreement in principle, I think they want to finish more of the details specifically. In fact, we're still getting additional things there, even as late as yesterday, that uh, that enhance the agreement. So uh, I'd rather get a, a really good one than a quick one. So uh, uh, that's what's happening. It'll be up to the USTR when they finish, feel its deal is finished, and the president can announce the details of that. Mr. Uh, how, was your, how was your phone call with President Trump this afternoon? What did you discuss? And are you really going to allow the administration to proceed with logging in Alaska? <laughs> call with President Trump. That was kind of public. I think everybody heard that. It was, uh, uh, he just wanted to uh, uh, express to the farmers he appreciated uh, what they do and their patience there. Didn't have anything to do with logging in Alaska, though. Yes, sir. But he has asked you about logging. Pardon? He has asked you to expand logging in Alaska. Do you intend to allow him to do that? We, we've talked about that, and we're working through that in the uh, in the proper way. We'll be uh, issuing the uh, recommendations to the president soon on that. We're having financially in the industry right now, uncertain how we finish up. Are you confident the safety net that you've been given from Congress and the Farm Bill will be adequate to get us through? Well, that combined with the market facilitation program, uh, as well as the uh, market access program, we we spent $200 million last year and going to be appropriating $100 million this year, that $16 billion, to continue to expand our markets with our cooperators across the world. Uh, that and taking off a billion two more product into there and to the people who need the food, all those things combined, uh, we never uh, thought that it would make people whole, but uh, I hope it will make people survive in order to do it again, and farmers are kind of used to that. They're good years, and they're not so good years, and I'm hoping that uh, we can uh, uh, facilitate people and their lenders being able to farm again. It's not frustrating. He's a very dynamic leader, and uh, he knows where he wants to go. I think the essence of a good leader is someone who is forceful, dynamic, and directional, and knows what they want to do, but always keeps a little back door open for other opinions, and that's what I found him to be. Uh, if I continue to speak up and to uh, talk to him about and give him the facts there, he's a business guy that understands that uh, sometimes he may need to change his mind, and that's, that's what happens. sounds like a zero tolerance question there. We don't know that we'll uh, fill all 550. Obviously, our goal was to be for many people to come with us as would, and that invitation is still there. We won't know that until September the 30th. We, again, have delayed some of that because of critical functional issues uh, to give people some opportunity to longer to make that decision uh, in that way and getting some of the business out from NIFA and the grants and the awards done. I'm confident that it will get done. GSA is in the midst of taking bids for the best space in Kansas City uh, metro area right now, and we think it will be a, a good opportunity there. We think all the right reasons that made us begin to look at that we think are still valid and still there. I'm hoping that more and more people that are currently employed with NIFA and ERS will make the decision to come with us to provide uh, that stability that we would love to have going forward. We are advertising and have onboarded some people out there already. Some of the current ERS and NIFA people have moved prematurely there, and we're providing that space in the Beacon Center for them. So we expect uh, business to carry on. We uh, 
uh, we don't want to fumble the ball, and uh, I don't have any idea, I don't have any expectation at this point about any other agencies that would be relocated. Regarding the concerns, anytime there's economic stress in the ag community or any economic sector, uh, there's anxiety, there's uh, there's emotional distress. It, it, it affects families, it affects uh, communities. Uh, you don't buy those pickups and equipment and uh, go to the store like you would in small rural towns like you would ordinarily, but that's to be expected. Farmers have gone through those kind of periods before, and I would, I would submit to you that uh, these kind of economic challenges started long before there was any sort of trade disruption that happened. Uh, you know that it was not easy in farming prior to uh, prior to 17 and when any kind of discussions with China happened. They were just making it, making it by then. So uh, we hope that will recover uh, very quickly when we get trade reestablished and that people have a good uh, exercise. The last part of your question. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. I think the speaker's really pretty, uh, I, I think she's trying to play it fair and square by giving her caucus enough opportunity to ask the questions that their constituents may have over some of the enforceability issues and for some of the points they want to make. I think Ambassador Lighthizer is doing a very good, patient job in trying to deal with them uprightly, fairly, transparently about what things can be tweaked and what cannot be tweaked. And I'm hoping she will uh, come to the conclusion that her caucus is ready to vote on that sooner rather than later. Uh, from what I hear about her members out as I visit districts across the country, uh, many of her members are supportive. They just don't want to get out in front of her, and I understand that. Yeah, we, we had you earlier. Can I get some of these other guys? I think again, uh, anytime you're in economic stress and duress, there's a uh, there's kind of a pall that goes over. But I, I just have to tell you, I don't know of any sector in the economy that is resilient as agriculture, and it's kind of a way of life in, in the fact that we like to make money, uh, but occasionally we know that the corn the corn doesn't come up or get rained out and we get prevented planting and those kind of things. These are people just keep on keeping on, and uh, while and, and I'm amazed by their persistence and resilience and their patience and their patriotism, honestly. It's a, it's a real tribute to the American spirit. I think that is absolutely what President Trump senses about the American farmer rancher is that they are the essence of the American spirit that built this country. And I think that's why he, uh, he has a fondness and affection for him. I think that's why he feels capable of pursuing the deal with China because he knows that these folks are long-term players and they uh, they don't like cheaters. I, I'm really sorry. I can't hear you. If you want to come up here closer, I might can hear because I can't hear with a fan in the background. can't share the details of the small refinery waiver uh, mitigation work that we're working on right now. We hope, I think that's really something the president is working very hard on. I think he wants to deliver that news himself, and hopefully that can be sooner rather than later. I think uh, if you're asking when that can be announced, I think uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks they're trying to work on the president's schedule. I think he'd like to come out here and uh, face the community and uh, and deliver the news himself. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Somebody over here? Yeah, I just got to talk about this. So, what do you think the administration is Say again. I think the, what the administration is doing to build ethanol demand is the primarily the E15, the E10, E15 uh, movement. Now it's up to the industry uh, and us to help build the infrastructure that can deliver that to the consumer. I'm confident that consumers, when they have a higher octane product with better gas uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, possibilities and a lower price, the co consumers are smart. They're going to choose that. They've got to have access to that. They've got to have that E15 pump when they when they ride up there and 
and the president has authorized these E10 pumps that uh, 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 can utilize E15 now. We're working through those uh, processes and regulations with EPA to get that done. That's how we build demand, and I, I would submit to you that's more important than any other things we talk about. Going from E10 to E15 is... Uh, Is uh, uh, very important. That's like that's like 50 percent, and we can't expect that kind of growth in corn export demand to be in eight, to be in bushels over that period of time. Will it be a process? Yes. We need to build that process out as quickly as possible. That's where we're trying to work with the industry, both independent stations and others, to build that infrastructure. is the media trying to go out and discover that one person or two people that don't like it and focus their media uh, 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 discussions and, uh, uh, and reports on those. What I find, yes, is that is it waning? Are people anxious still? Are people hopeful and ready for a solution? Absolutely. But I don't know that I would use the word waning. I think, again, farmers are honest people. Uh, they deal, they want to deal with people who are honest. And for the most part, thank you very much. For the most part, I think uh, they realize that China, not just in the last little bit, for a long time, has built their economy on the back of American innovation and creativity and, and, and entrepreneurship. And has stolen technology, has used that to build their economy, their military, and their, their goal of world dominance. And that's what President Trump has thrown the flag and said, you know, we're not going to allow that to happen. And I think farmers understand that. Farmers are long-term players. You don't just get into farming for this next season. There's nobody in and out of farming. It's a, it's a decision you make for the long term, and I think they, they understand that. Are they, are they anxious? Absolutely. It's not fun to be under economic distress, so there's no doubt there. But I don't think what the media is trying to make out is that farmers are leaving President Trump and his decisions. It's not accurate whatsoever. Secretary, uh, President Trump has suggested that perhaps Beijing is trying to wait him out uh, after a Democrat could potentially become elected in 2020. Uh, do you think he can close a deal with China in this first term, or would he need a second term to get that done? I think he would love to close the deal, but that ball is in China's court. Uh, we were very close in April, if you remember. We were actually probably 90% toward what would be a very good deal there. Uh, it was China who backtracked and reneged on some of the commitments they made. Apparently, President Xi didn't have his hardliners in as much control as he thought he did. And uh, when they realized where we were headed, uh, then they pulled him back from that. They have their political divisions over there just like we do here. And while he's, I guess, a leader for life, he has still to answer to the uh, Politburo or the uh, or whatever that group in China is called and, uh, and to answer that. But I, I think uh, President Trump is ready to make a deal whenever China comes to the table and decides they want to make a deal. Uh, he's the one that thinks if their goal is to wait him out, I think they got a long time to wait. Yeah, Are you remember the press, sir? Yeah. My farm too. I had a farmer too. Talking about the, the trade issues, we are seeing our competitors around the world continue to grow more acreage, uh, undercut us, so to speak, in many areas. The situation with Amazon right now. How far can we go before we lose permanent market share? I know that's always a concern. It's one of the major questions we have about regaining market share. I've been in the grain business for 40 years, and I had good customers, but if I didn't pay the right price, they were going somewhere else. I think that's the way world buyers are as well. And I had to be competitive. I, I, they knew I'd give good service. They knew I'd be honest. But if I didn't, my price wasn't competitive, then they were going somewhere else. That's the way the grain trade works, and that's the way it will work going forward. We'll get these markets back because they know we've got the quality, and uh, the reliability of production, and we do what we we have contract law that does what we say we're going to do. There's no this uh, turmoil about whether the U.S. can be counted on. That's why the USMCA is so important to make deals with our nearest neighbors. I think we'll regain the market back. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I've got a question on the future market. Most 
be a discovery or fight. And we always had position limits, so people didn't have a tremendous amount of economic power. The farmers understand if there's a big crop out there and the price is going down, when you got a crop like this and the price is down to almost contract lows, the problem seems to be the commodity farmers. of each person that they trade for 500 people. So they have tremendous economic power within a millisecond of pushing a market. Is anybody in Washington addressing that? Well, I think the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, that's under their purview. I hope they're looking at that. We mentioned things like that from time to time over convergence issues and, and that. Uh, the rapid trading issues, both on the stock market and the commodity market, is of concern in that area. That's one of the reasons you, most people here don't know, but uh, we disallowed those media outlets to be in our WASD uh, uh, there because they had that millisecond, two seconds head start on the world uh, out here to uh, to get the information out to their their traders, and that's one of the reasons we did that because we wanted everybody on a on a level playing field to do that. Secretary, can you address the, the president's asking you to open pockets in national forest in Alaska for logging? What will that entail? Uh, yeah, I think this is the same question earlier. I'm sorry, I missed it. Yeah, and I said well, what we're doing right now is uh, uh, we're obligated to provide recommendations to the administration, and those are forthcoming pretty quickly, probably in a few weeks, and uh, uh, we'll make a decision on that uh, about the Tongass in southeast Alaska at that point in time and have open for comment. Can continue to release the same data they do in August, or do we need yield updates or that? Yeah, I think this upcoming uh, WASI, I think it's September the 12th, will be the new report. I met with NAS week before last and last week. We think the FSA numbers over planning intentions and NAS are uh, coming together. There's always been some description di difference over the way our prevented planning and cover crops are handled, but uh, by and large, those seem to be coming together more so. Uh, I think uh, the market was shocked because most of the industry uh, people have had much lower numbers than NAS came out with um, based on their based on what they tell me about their satellite survey they are more confident about their numbers than they were uh, at that last report so we'll see right. Thank you.